Next we welcome Rod Bazanovic. Rod manages a local laws team of 21, including admin and officers. The team is responsible for all animal management issues, traffic and parking, and local law matters. Rod has been with the City of Casey for approximately eight years and has been in local government for 22 years in total, including the Shire of Yarra Ranges and Knox City. Please welcome Rod. Uh, thank you for that. Um, thank you, Jerry. I think Jerry's already done a runner. Um, yes, the city of Casey. What an interesting mix that is. Um, I'll just go through some demographics and some stats for you to start with in relation to this family violence issue. Um, the city of Casey has the unenviable title or honour of having the highest incidence of family violence reported within its municipality. Um, that goes along with having the highest number of people in a municipality. Uh, that's just raw data per 100,000. Um, La Trobe City Council has the unenviable task of having the highest number of incidents reported per head of population per 100,000. So, but we've got the highest incidents just because of our size. Um, it is estimated that about 70% of all reports, uh, of all instances of family violence are not reported. It's also known that it takes approximately seven instances of family violence before a victim could even possibly contact the authorities and report the matter. So, if you think of the just natural raw data, if you've got 70% not reporting it, that line that we've got is um, quite horrendous. Um, number one priority for Victoria Police, 40, that's actually increased now to about 45% of their whole workload capacity is related to family violence. It is a serious crime um, and it does take them away from other crimes, but as um, Jerry mentioned, one or two women die every week as a result of family violence. We've had instances in our municipality um, that a staff member of the City of Casey was murdered as a result of family violence, and at that family violence incident, her dog was guarding the body, and my staff had to go in and remove that dog uh, from a person that had been murdered that they knew about, that knew that person intimately. So the stress levels associated with an incident of family violence can spread far and wide in a very short amount of time. Um, we're lucky enough in the city of Casey to have a dedicated family violence unit stationed at the Cranbourne Police Station um, and we have a very close working relationship with them. We're tackling this issue um, heads on, both of us together, as a partnership um, and public safety issue. This is st statistics from 2013-14. Charges laid, 1,758 charges laid against individuals in relation to family violence, not by us, but by police. We've certainly issued a fair amount of charges in relation to cruelty, um, but I'll, more about that later. Um, in all those instances, there was 1,452 children present. Um, do the maths once again. Um, the amount of safety notices and intervention notices issued by the Victoria Police at the time of the incident is 1,100, and that has increased to 1,300 now in this current data. From the stats and the percentages, it is believed that 40% of women, uh, 40,000 people in, in the women in the city of Casey are victims of family violence. That's one in three. I'll, before I go on to this next bit, I'll describe a situation that my Victorian colleagues will know about that I've um, detailed to them um, during the family violence training that I've been undertaking with um, other councils and the local government professionals in the MAV of Victoria uh, to local law enforcement officers. An incident occurred in 2012 where um, we had a report of a serious dog attack where two large bull mastiff dogs were involved in a serious attack on livestock. We had a very good idea where those dogs came from um, we attended the, the site where the attack took place. The victims confirmed our suspicions um, and we knew where the dogs came from. Um, we attended the location where the dogs came from, found the dogs pretty easily. They were covered in blood, pretty hard not to miss them. Um, a woman on site uh, was there pleading her case in a, asking that the officers do not take the dogs. Um, she was there by herself. Uh, there were probably three or four officers, uh, th four I think, three female, one male. Um, the reason why four officers went there, because the person that lives there, the male, is an absolute nutcase. He's a very violent individual. Um, this lady was saying, don't take the dogs, he's going to blame me. 
Uh, don't take the dogs. He can get really nasty. Um, don't take the no dogs. You don't know what he's capable of. The officers all thought to themselves, look, yeah, OK, we understand all that love. Not a problem. Here's our card. Tell your partner to call us tonight when he gets home from work. Um, the officers took the dogs, seized them, left seizure notices, um, obtained information from witnesses, did everything by the book, absolutely spot on. Tactically, perfect. Um, the next day, we were informed by members of uh, Victoria Police that upon returning home, that male, her partner, um, she was right. He didn't like that the dogs were taken. He did blame her and consequently beat the living daylights out of her. Uh, to make matters worse, the lady was six months pregnant and lost a child as a result of the beating. Um, when the officers found out this information the following day, um, it created a whole new dilemma for us. We had to manage um, those staff who felt personally responsible for what had happened, even though they did nothing wrong. But because they weren't trained or knew what to look out for for the signs of family violence, their actions contributed to an incident of horrendous family violence. That was the catalyst that led us to where we are now in that we put a family violence lens on just about all of our work. Coupled in that we have got the highest incidence of family violence, number one issue, family violence unit in Cranbourne Police Station, dedicated intervention orders, you name it, we thought we've got to do something about this and we then undertake, we reviewed all of our standard operating procedures and we do our work and our job totally differently to what we did to three, four years ago. Um, that then, since doing that, um, the City of Casey has led um, a family violence challenge project or framework uh, with, three, with two other adjoining municipalities, the, the City of Greater Dandenong and Cardinia. We were lucky enough to get $600,000 from the state government to implement this work. Um, during that work that we were involved in, um, we did extensive work with promoting peace and faith in, in communities. We went to um, religious centres, sporting clubs, um, places where people gather, um, trying to get the message across in relation to family violence. Um, and it was well received. As a result of that, the Challenge Project morphed into training a bunch of individuals, all men, because, let's face it, men are the perpetrators of family violence in 95% of cases. Even when it's against other men, it's men that are doing it. Um, the, the challenge project um, obtained or got people included from that have influence within the community or within their sporting club or within their business who can try and change or lead change in this area of family violence. Um, and I must say that project is now drawing to a conclusion and there have been many, many people that have been trained up to recognise the signs of family violence and have gone out into the community, into the wider community and back in to their clubs and so forth so they can then try and change the, the, the thought process and the mindset of individuals towards family violence. At Casey, um, itself, the City Council, uh, a men's action team was developed. I'm one of the founding members of that action team where there's a group of leaders, of, um, of team leaders and managers um, who are responsible to try and work within their spheres of influence to manage family violence. I took that on board for, for my local laws unit, said, OK, these are the things I can do. Someone in the workshop said, I can do this. Someone said, I can do that. So we're trying to change the organisation from internally. Uh, yep, you saw all that, that's fine. Um, the whole thing then started with me personally after that trigger point of the incident was when I went, we were still grappling with what we needed to do and what we needed to obtain and how we managed this. I was invited to a white ribbon breakfast. And at that breakfast, the, the sergeant in charge of the family violence spoke. That was a light bulb moment. We had a trigger point, then I had a light bulb. And I think to myself, these guys knock on the same doors, and they speak to the same people. Let's face it, we all know the business. Um, we deal with the same people. So I spoke to him, and um, through him, we were managed to find and implement and uh, deliver training to the staff in relation to family violence and all its associated um, issues. So we, we know that family violence is the physical violence aspect, but there are also many other factors of family violence that aren't so easy to find. 
Um, there's religious violence in where you're told where you can't practice a certain religion. There's financial, where you're given you know, the household money of $20, that's all you got, make it last. Um, there's sexual violence, and, and the list goes on. It's quite extensive. And um, before we did this training, we had no idea. I mean, I certainly didn't. I mean, I, I know about family violence. So I'm a victim of it because my father used to beat my mother. Um, so, and, and I think there's probably within this audience here, we've probably got the majority of people who know that aspect as well. Um, so we, we drew the correlation that there was um, little training within our, within our sector to be able to do anything about that. So we sourced it and implemented it. In fact, we did the same training as Victoria Police, which is called CRAF training, the Common Risk Assessment Framework. So the members of Victoria Police and our local laws officers are now getting the same level of training to recognise signs of family violence. Um, the job itself of a local laws officer or a ranger or whatever you want to call it is we deal with victims and we deal with offenders. Simple language, we all know that. It's bread and butter stuff. Those people too are normal people and they could be offenders or family violence. Um, the violent behaviour. We all know how to look for violent behaviour, but we didn't know how to look for the subtle bits of violent behaviour. The language, the signs, the, the little signs. You go into a house and there's a, there's a hole punched in through the wall and someone says, oh, geez, he had a bad night, but there's violence present. So you, you just to gel that all together and work on it so you know what you're dealing with and what to look for. Um, Identified the correlation between violence and violence towards pets. As Jerry was just saying before, it is certainly used as a, as a control method in a family violence situation. We know of many instances and have seen and witnessed many instances where an animal is, is the woman has not been touched physically. She's never been beaten, she's never been slapped or threatened with her physical um, being. But the threat is, if you leave this relationship, I'm going to kill your cat. You leave this relationship, I'm going to shoot the dog. And we have seen it. We have seen cats decapitated. We have seen cats thrown in a microwave oven. We have seen um, dogs hung up, as Jerry described, and strangled. Um, and that is unfortunately far too common as well. Um, the stat of one in three women have uh, uh, faced with family violence. The statistic also is present that between in each one of those five to six instances, there's also a pet victim of family violence in that it's been kicked, it's been thrown through a window, whatever the case may be. So once again, those stats are huge. When you look at the statistics I gave you at the beginning, you do the maths in that one as well. A huge percentage of animals are hurt, maimed or killed as a result of family violence each year in our municipality alone. Um, when we had that trigger point, we then looked back over cases that we had dealt with and we definitely located a number that we could identify that there was direct correlation from our actions. We're, we're pretty hard on matters of dog attack and so forth. We execute search, search warrants. We make no excuses about that. We go in there, we deal with it, and we take the dog away and then we charge the offender. Um, as a result of our hard line, we believe that there were some instances where we might have, might have contributed to further instances of family violence. So we decided we'd change that operation altogether. That's not to say we don't execute search warrants anymore. We choose a time when we do execute it, that when he's home, that's when we execute it. So that we know he's there. We gather intelligence, we do operational orders, we brief and we debrief. We don't go in guns blazing. I used to be a, a shocker for guns blazing. You can ask Elka. I used to work with Elka all the time at a previous council. Uh, I, was, I was a loose wire. I used to go in there and ask questions later. You can't do that. It in fact impacts other people. We do a, take a scientific approach. Because of our close working relationship with Cranbourne Police Violence Unit, we contact them and say, is there anything known about this idiot? And say, yeah, we know him. That's all we need to know. That's all we need to know. And then we formulate a plan on how we're going to deal with it. Um, and by taking that responsibility, I can tell you that since we've implemented this, implemented this approach of recognising family violence, knowing what to look for and what to see, I can honestly tell you that there's been zero instances where we have put a female in danger of possible further harm through our actions. In fact, we've probably gone the other way. We know that sometimes we've been overly cautious and the crook has got away. And we think, so be it, we'll get him next time. And you know what, they always pop up again. They can't change. Uh, if it's one week, one month, one year later, we'll get them again. No dramas with that. Um, 
finding shelter for you and your pet, um, what we have done as a council is, as Jerry also said, people, uh, women do not want to leave a relationship just in case, uh, because their animal has been threatened of harm or death. They're going to stay in that relationship and say, well, at least if he's hitting me, he's not killing my cat. Um, as um, Conrad said at his earlier speech, um, that 60% of people in an emergency or a disaster won't leave their pet behind. Same goes for family violence. I don't have a stat for you on that one. I don't think it's important. But um, many women will not leave a violent relationship for fear of harm to their pet. What we offer is that we will hold up that pet for you if you need to leave. No refuge will take a pet, as Jerry said as well. Um, so if a woman wants to leave a relationship and find a refuge, find solace somewhere and get away from a violent relationship, she is then secure and safe to know that her animal, her dog or cat, is being looked after. Uh, we have had dozens and dozens and dozens of animals like that that we have looked after, some cases for six months or more at our cost. I get into trouble with my bosses for exceeding my budget and so forth and I say, well, you go tell this poor woman that um, you, you, you're putting budget ahead of her safety. So said, oh, no, 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 we're not having an issue with that, you know, just if you can just bring it down. I said, yeah, whatever. So it's, I don't think it's, um, money is the issue here and I really do not give a toss how much it costs, but I will keep a dog in safe custody or a cat in safe custody until I know that woman is safe and sound and secure somewhere else away from a violent relationship. We've even gone as far as sending a dog back to that victim. Um, they've moved out of state and um, my... my my colleagues again from Victoria know this story quite well. Um, we had a woman in Victoria Mine Municipality who moved to Queensland up here. So she wasn't a Mexican anymore. She went up north. And we had her dog for about six months. It was a Malamute. The damn thing cost me an arm and leg to send up here. But so what? She got her dog back and she sends us Christmas cards now. She's very happy with the way it was all treated. And she could leave a violent relationship. So her partner at the time does not know where she is anymore and she could be reunited with her dog. Her life is now complete. She's absolutely stoked. Um, one of the um, bylines out of this was we formed a very close relationship with our health promotion team because they're the experts in, in all things health, the majority of them are, and in a lot of cases they are also in family violence. Um, they were an invaluable source of... Um, inspiration and help to me when we were going through this very tragic time when that original incident took place. Um, sessions were conducted by, for all staff, including admin. Quite often the administrative staff are forgotten. But if you think about it logically, um, admin staff take the calls, speak to the people at the counter, get the emails, get the communication about all sorts of things, including just a simple thing like an infringement notice. Oh, can you please make sure that that doesn't, doesn't go to my home address? My, my husband won't be happy. Um, we have had instances where people have been issued an infringement notice and we haven't even entered the data yet. They come in to pay it. So, oh, I don't want my husband to find out. All those little things that you think, oh, well, you know, whatever, they're all signs of family violence. Uh, and, it, and that's just fact. It's just pure and simple fact. Um, once we started going through that family violence process and looking at through the gen, uh, family violence um, lens, we then require, we were required to um, modify all of our standard operating procedures. What a huge ask. When you put a slant, and I thought it would only be a couple of lines that we have to add in somewhere or a page or two, when you drill down to it and look through every single thing that we do as local laws officers, um, you have to apply that in every single context uh, that we undertake. So once again, you put that slant on it. Um, and I was accepted as a White Ribbon Ambassador through the White Ribbon um, Foundation. It's an honour that I um, hold very dear to me. Um, we certainly know more incidents are occurring out there and we're responding to them. Um, we get calls from the Victoria Police generally uh, um, several times a week in relation to this sort of stuff, so we information share, like I said before. Uh, the staff are certainly better resourced and are enjoying their work because um, as opposed to being a head kicker and going out there and issuing infringement notices and seizing animals, they're actually making a real difference in the way um, people perceive us in the community and also th that they, the, the victims of crime, uh, have really got someone that they can um, hear them 
and we can support them in their process and in the scourge that is family violence. Um, a bit of community profile, I don't know about that, the community doesn't really know what we're doing and we're happy with that, that's fine, we're not out there for recognition but we're happy to support the community. Um, and the good one is that it's broadened the role from just enforcement, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but uh, it's also included in public health. Um, and it's something that is really, really important um, to grasp that and introduce it and deliver it. Um, models for other councils, absolutely. Like I said at the beginning, um, we've been doing a travelling roadshow across the state of Victoria um, and have trained up or presented to approximately 200, 250 local laws officers. Um, the funding, unfortunately, has run out for that. Hopefully some more will come through. Um, we'll see them wait. Um, easily applied to other councils um, and easily applied to your own council. Uh, the cost is not that great. It's a bit of training and a little bit of education. That's it. You don't have to buy specialist equipment. You don't have to buy um, whiz-bang machinery or computer apps or anything like that. It's just a bit of training. Um, where the cost comes in, if you decide to offer a shelter for animals for victims of family violence, absolutely there's a cost factor. But like I said, to say to my bosses, how much money do you place on a human life? Um, they can't answer that one. Um, within the role of the local laws officer that is many and varied, we get disclosures all the time. Last Friday, for instance, a woman pulled up in our, our car park of our municipal office in a permit area, one of the local laws officers was outside saying, excuse me, you can't park there. The, the woman in the car looked at her. She was um, bleeding. She was distraught. She was crying. Um, the officer helped her out of the car. It was a female officer. Uh, helped her out of the car. That female officer was only a new um, starter with us. She did her craft training on the Wednesday, and this incident happened on the Friday. So she was very raw and very aware of what was going on. Um, the woman needed help. She asked her some questions. And said, are you okay? Are you safe? What a great question. Are you safe? No, I'm not. My partner's after me. How did you get injured? He threw a cup at me. He threw a mug. She had a cut under her eye that needed, required stitching. Her eye was closed up. And she was very unsteady on her feet and slurring. And she goes, I think my partner has drugged me. Um, the officer called the ambulance. The ambulance attended, took her away. The police were called. The partner was arrested. There was a history of family violence in that relationship. Um, and yes, she had been drugged. Um, and the intervention of that officer certainly helped that woman because that, her partner was out looking for her. Um, an infringement notice, classic example. We had um, an officer issue an infringement notice to a, a woman, or was about to, sorry, to issue an infringement notice to a woman in a no-stopping zone outside of school. And the officer approached her, actually was going to ask her to move on. She became very agitated, very angry, very abusive. Uh, she was a Muslim woman, she had a head covering on. Um, she seemed to have been crying recently. Uh, at that point, she removed her head covering and showed it to the officer. Can you just imagine in what sort of state this poor woman is uh, of that religion to remove a head covering and show a man um, who's an enforcement officer in the street? Um, she was black and blue. Um, she goes, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I, I need help and so forth. The officer was very new as well. He was very young. He was a 22, 23 year old officer. He helped her out enormously. He, he couldn't care where people were parking, even though that's associated risks in itself, but this is a bigger risk. So he made the right call and he helped her out. Um, and contacted the agencies, contacted Victoria Police, and happy to say that that woman is now getting on with her life outside that relationship. Um, what we are also finding is sibling violence towards mother, father, and so on. In this case that I'm just about to talk to you about, there was... Um, an issue in relation to a restricted breed dog, a pit bull, as we all know what that is. Um, the offer, officer attended. He could see that the pit bull was inside the house. He could see it through the window. He said, I need to seize that. Um, the mother said, that's not my dog. I said, I don't want it here. It's bitten me. It's a dangerous, you know, it's a shark on legs. I don't want it here. Um, the woman said, it's also my son's dog. Um, he's just come out of jail. He was about 19 years of age or something like that. He's very violent, he's not, you know, he won't like it if you take the dog. The officer immediately backed off and said, not a problem, when do you expect your son home? I don't know. He comes and goes as he pleases. The officer gave the woman his personal mobile number and said, you text me on this when, you when your son is home. He received a text that night at about 12 o'clock. He, he attended, he wasn't on call or on duty or on backup or anything like that, 
Uh, he lives in the municipality. He collected another officer. They went to that address at about 12.30, 1 o'clock at night uh, with police, and they seized that dog. That woman was taken out of the loop. She was not threatened. She was not damaged. She was nothing because we dealt with him. He's the offender. He's the idiot. Deal with him. Um, we've gone through the process, and I can tell you, and once again, like Conrad said, evaluate, redo, redraft, and so forth. We have re-evaluated and redrafted what we do since we've been doing this in about 2012, half a dozen times or more, um, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and I think, when will it end? But there is no end to it. We'll just keep re-evaluating. Re the debriefing process after an incident is paramount, and so that we can learn from it and put into practice the learnings that we learn from it. Um, improving it continually, trying to, with limited resources like we all have. Um, training and support. Happy to say out of that $600,000 that we received from state government, I, was mani I managed to pinch some money out of that. And I got some staff trained at a much higher level in recognition of family violence and negotiation um, through the Department of Justice. It was um, money well worth and well spent. Um, and some of them are actually now qualified um, negotiators to be able to deal with instances like what is family violence. But they don't with the, deal with the family violence aspect. Don't get me wrong. We don't get involved in that. That's the police issue and the court's issue. What they're dealing with is what, where we come in, in the animal aspect of it. Um, and once again, sharing the model with councils. I think that's about it for me. Um, they're my contact details. An interesting point, this young fellow here, the tall one, um, he was a local laws officer, and then he decided to join the dark side and join Victoria Police. He went backwards in his career, I believe. Um, but he, he's actually now uh, at the Cranbourne Family Violence Unit. After we, started doing the Cranbourne, um, after we started doing family violence stuff, he really got entrenched in it and decided, I want to do something more than what we're doing. Not that what we're doing is bad, it's good, but I want to go and get the mongrel who's beating up that woman. So he joined Victoria Police. He was lucky enough to get in. And he's, he's a junior member. He's only been out of the academy six months. And he's already in the family violence unit, which is a specialist unit. And he's uh, earmarked to stay there for some time because he's delivering on, uh, on every aspect of his work. So something as simple as introducing it into your work practice has changed his career. Even though he calls me and says, oh my god, I never should have left. I'm getting $20,000 less a year than I was there. Uh, I don't have a car anymore. But he is making a real difference. And um, something simple as that, you know, who knows where it can lead. That's it for me. It's four o'clock. I know we're finished a bit early, but um, <laughs> I can do you a song and dance if you like, but no, seriously. <laughs>